on this eerie edition of Science World. Are we alone in the universe? We'll talk to some who think so, many who don't, then meet a real-life UFO investigator and ask him, are we alone? Answers to that mystery and much more coming up on Science World. Many swear they've seen them, ridden them, even been abducted by them. Others have dreamed them up, faked them, and know darn well there's no such thing. And while their existence has not been proven, there is no doubt flying saucers, unidentified flying objects, space aliens are a great curiosity. In addition to books and movies and film clips, there are well over 600,000 internet sightings of UFOs. Proof positive, not that extraterrestrials exist, but that many on Earth believe they do. So if there are intelligent beings in the universe, one obvious conclusion might be that we're not among them, or that we human beings are apparently not worth contacting. There is also the possibility, as we scan the sky, that signals have come from other worlds and our technology is too primitive to find them among the inherent noise of the universe. American University astronomer Richard Berenson. It is possible right now that there are many billions of potential life sites across the cosmos that are sending radiation of some form at this very instant if we only knew where and how to look. A valid scientific search of the skies continues from Earth unabatedly at the SETI Institute. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It is a nonprofit corporation sponsored in part by the U.S. Space Agency and the National Science Foundation. SETI's mission is to serve as a home for scientific and educational projects about the prevalence of life in the universe. We're listening. We're listening for the radio signals from intelligent civilizations on the worlds of distant stars. Dr. Frank Drake pioneered the exploration in 1960, carrying out humanity's first search for interstellar radio transmissions at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bay, West Virginia. And the search continues today. SETI's equipment has grown massively. SETI focuses the world's largest radio telescopes in the United States, Australia, and Puerto Rico on thousands of stars thought similar to our sun. They pick up a blizzard of signals, 56 million per second, that are scanned by high-speed computers in search of who knows what. We listen for a great variety of possible signals, um, Morse code-like signals, radar signals, signals like the telemetry from spacecraft. This is an example of what an extraterrestrial signal might look like. Notice it's turning on and off, and when we see this signature, then we know that it's a possible detection. It's a very exciting moment when you think you really have the signal. So far, none of the signals that have made us excited, that have gotten us out of our chairs, has turned out to be extraterrestrial. I mean, we haven't found ET signal, and let's, let's be straight up about that. SETI scientists aren't surprised or discouraged. Astrophysicist Jill Tarter. The contact between us and another intelligent species is inevitably going to be lopsided. We are a very young technology in a very old universe. And an older technology will have had this contact before. Astrophysicist Dan Workmeyer. There's a good chance that radio signals are going right past this planet, and we could discover them right now if we knew where to point the telescope and what frequency to look at. Conversely, aliens listening for us could be having similar problems. Every good candidate signal has eventually been identified as one of our own. For good reason, says Professor Freeman Dyson of the Institute for Advanced Study. If we want to describe ourselves, we are the babbling species. Earthlings have been sending messages for years in the form of radio and television signals. 
I have a dream. Others may hate you. Add the growing number of communication satellites, air traffic, and even cell phones drowning out what might be an intelligent signal from space. It's like having two and a quarter billion radios going on simultaneously and say, ah, that one over there has a signal that's intelligent and not static. Seth Shostak. We're hoping that the people at the other end of, of the, the link we're looking for are deliberately beaming a signal our way to make it easy for us, some sort of hailing signal. So if there is a distant civilization out there and it did get in touch, big ifs, then what? Right now, we don't have any way of answering the question, should we reply? And if we do, what should we say? And who should speak for Earth? The SETI folks aren't discouraged in the least. SETI's Doug Vachov. I don't think we're going to understand immediately what they have to say. And even if they could understand us, then what? this decade and do the other thing. They probably know a lot better than we do what works. It's going to be, tell us what the instructions are. How do we proceed? It may not hurt to hold off, think about it for a few months or for a few years or even decades. But it's certainly something to think about, and the scientists at the SETI Institute are. life on Mars. It's clear now from the U.S. Pathfinder mission we're not going to find what we'd hope to find in two sophisticated creatures you could sit down with and talk to. Instead, any life on Mars will probably be very small and very simple like these bacteria. What kind of conversation can you have with bacteria? Well, a pretty good one because if that little rover on Mars turns up a fossil, we might be looking at our great, 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 great grandparents. After all, who says life in our solar system began on Earth? Would it be that our ancient ancestors might have started life on Mars or Venus and then somehow bounced to Earth like the Martian rock discovered in Antarctica that may have fossils in it? It was on Mars until a meteor smashed it into space where it drifted for a few million years until it got pulled into Earth. If a rock can go from planet to planet, could it carry something inside? go from Mars to Earth and land and get out and start a whole new life? That might have happened except for one big problem. These rocks can float around for 100 million years before reaching Earth. Could any creature live that long? Nobody thought so until California professor Raul Cano decided to examine a 25 million year old bee frozen in amber to see if anything in the bee was still alive. He cracked through the amber to get a bit of bee tissue. It turned out the little bacteria in the bee did wake up after a 25 million year sleep. Those little jiggly creatures are ancient bacteria come alive. So it is possible for a microbe to hibernate for millions of years and maybe even survive solar radiation and hot temperatures. Which then leaves the big question, did all of us who live on Earth, did we start here or bounce here? Once again, for an afternoon high in Roswell, 103. Hundreds of reporters, thousands of visitors, and millions of their dollars recently poured into this southeastern New Mexico town called Roswell. The look and the feel of Roswell is very much the carnival atmosphere you'd find at a fair. That's what makes it all so utterly strange. For what was supposedly being celebrated here was nothing less than the astonishing human capacity and need to believe. I really think that something did happen in 1947. You so? I'm not sure, but I'm not discounting the whole possibility either. And you so? I definitely believe there's something happened here. The only fact that we have about Roswell is that something happened near Roswell 50 years ago that is still covered up. High security. 
But what's packed crowds into Dennis Balthasar's museum is what millions of people like writer Donald Burleson think that something was. I think there's very strong evidence that, uh, that in fact it was extraterrestrial in nature, that bodies were recovered, uh, that a craft was retrieved, and that there has been and continues to be an enormous cover-up uh, to this day. The Roswell story begins with this 50-year-old headline that the U.S. Air Force dismissed the very next day. The so-called flying disc, they said, was just debris from a weather balloon and a radar reflector. And there the story stayed for 30 years. But in 1980, UFO enthusiasts began telling a far more dramatic Roswell story, dramatized in movies. You may be the first person in human history ever to see writing from another world. A Roswell mortician told of being asked for child-sized coffins, a trip to the Air Force base where he witnessed near panic the conversation with a nurse who spoke of alien bodies being brought in for autopsies. Others told of seeing a crashed aircraft, even a living alien. This one just moved. This is the story told in Roswell's downtown museum, and it's on display at John Price's more modest museum near the long-closed Air Force base where the creatures were supposedly brought. All the wreckage was taken right out here to the Roswell on the airfield. Uh, the, the pieces, the saucer, the bodies, the whole works. It was taken to this base just a few blocks from here. Don't trip over a cactus. <laughs> Hub Corn is a rancher who now owns the land where one witness said he saw a crashed saucer with dead and dying aliens. Even many of those who believe the alien crash story doubt that anything at all happened at this site. But the Torres family was curious enough to drive 12 hours from Kansas City to see for themselves. Uh, I really believe it happened. I, I believe the government does hide things from, from their citizens. I, I don't think that we're all that stupid. We're confident once the report is out and digested by the public that this will be the final word on the Roswell incident. Recently, the Air Force released a report on Roswell, repeating its assertion that the debris found was from a top-secret experiment to detect Soviet atomic tests. The report also offered evidence that the stories of alien deaths were a mixture of fabrications and bad memories. Supposedly, mystery sources were identified. Those still alive denied any knowledge of such events. But the report also claimed that the alien bodies some witnesses said they saw may have been test dummies, dummies that the Air Force did not start using until six years after the Roswell incident, an apparent inconsistency that's upsetting many here in Roswell. To us, basically, I think it's the biggest insult to the intelligence of the American people in many years. Why did they wait 50 years and then finally tell us? Yeah, and then if they're just dummies, why should they cover it up? Kent Jeffrey, a commercial airline pilot, wrote a petition called the Roswell Declaration that urged the government to open its UFO files. I even uh, considered uh, the possibility that the Roswell incident was indeed a real UFO. When Jeffrey obtained the files, he learned that top military officials back in 1948 had no evidence of UFOs and, in fact, were hoping to find such evidence. A Colonel Howard McCoy, who was chief of intelligence for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, stated if only one of these would crash in an area where we could recover it and find out what they are, words to that effect. And what happened when Jeffrey published his findings? I was surprised by some of my friends really, for all intent and purpose, totally disowning me because I was no longer towing the party line. There is a powerful hunger to believe in life on other worlds, and that hunger is being constantly fed. Bookstores are filled with allegedly eyewitness accounts of sightings and abductions. The whole notion that we are connected with something larger, in any case, I, I'm glad that we're finally sort of coming into a time when we can all sort of look at that rather differently than we did, let's say, in 1947, mm -hmm. and say, well, maybe it's time, you know, maybe it's time that we, we, we connect because it would be truly not only remarkable, but frankly a little appalling if we were indeed alone in the universe, don't you think? So what was being celebrated here then may well be neither science nor science fiction, but faith. So we camped out for a couple of nights and it hasn't gone off yet, so we don't know what's going to happen. But I have a camera set up just in case. 
a faith that teaches that if we only believe powerfully enough, we will reach the heavens, or they will reach down to us, that when we wish upon a star, our dreams do come true. Washington, D.C. is a place of politics and media events, press conferences, and congressional hearings. Despite all that, much of what goes on here is a mystery. So when a credible-looking group from across the country came here and announced, we are not alone, we listened. I know we're not alone in the universe. I was involved in situations where we actually did recoveries of, tra of crashed saucers, for lack of a better term, debris thereof. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. This is Talk to America with Carol Pearson. Yesterday there was an amazing news conference at the National Press Center in Washington. It was conducted by an emergency room doctor who has spent a great deal of his personal time interviewing people who say they have seen UFOs. These people all seem credible. Many of them are military officers and security officials, and they firmly believe that we are not alone. I'm Carol Pearson. What's more, they say that the United States government is in the know and is covering up the evidence. Today we'll hear both sides of the argument about the possibility of UFOs and extraterrestrial life forms. These folks firmly believe in alien beings, have first-hand experience of the UFO kind, and some are certain the U.S. government and others, maybe yours, are covering it up. We had it on radar, we had it on disk, we have the FAA's official report right here, and I took a video of it so you can see what we all saw on the day that this thing happened, if you want. Almost universally, UFOs and the possibilities of extraterrestrial life forms interest us. So we looked about for an independent investigator and found one in our very midst. Milton Auercade is a journalist by profession and one of the most respected senior correspondents in the Latin American division of the Voice of America. His beat is primarily politics, but when he's not discussing trade or changing U.S.-Latin American relations or AIDS policies, he has another serious interest. Investigador de OVNIs. Investigator de OVNIs. That's Spanish for UFO investigator. I think that's a, a good description of what I am. Uh, investigator, someone who studies uh, the general problem, the general issue, and uh, someone dedicated to this subject for almost 44 years, 43 years, let's say. Milton Auercade is a UFO investigator, a detective, a Sherlock Holmes, so to speak, of things extraterrestrial. He's written three scholarly accounts of his studies. We were not looking for uh, the little green man around the corner, but we were looking to find the truth, and that was all. And that's the main issue of any scientific investigation about something apparently mysterious, something that, that uh, leads you to a big quest, and apply a rational criteria uh, to analyze the data, and go on uh, uh, having in your mind always uh, what is called the Occam's razor. Also called the law of economy, a maxim in science that the simplest hypothesis is most likely to be correct. It's a tool for getting to the truth. An epistemological approach according to which you go from the most possible to the most impossible hypothesis. I see. Step by step. <laughs> so you have the task to be like a Sherlock Holmes, to follow up these uh, footprints left here, there, and then put them together and see what is going on, what picture you get. I'm beginning to see the pattern. Stop now. 
Sherlock, I mean Milton, repeatedly stresses the importance of the scientific nature of his queries. He's personally investigated hundreds of UFO reports. They all begin with an interview. Tell us what happened. That's the first question. And let the witness say, oh, what happened? And then you start with step-by-step uh, -step particular questions, mostly to clarify things that are not very clear mm -hmm. from the first statement. Let's say that the person say, well, I see a kind of a structure in the air. Uh, it was not just a point. It, was, it, has a, it has a size, a considerable size, and colors, and this and that. You won't suggest what well, colors. You won't suggest, uh, for instance, and did you see windows, or do you see, see antennae, or the kind of things that can lead the witness to things that really uh, were not seen. Mm -hmm. One thing is that I saw a light. Uh huh. Well, maybe it was a planet. That's simple. But if someone comes with, uh, I saw uh, lights in uh, my farm. And uh, the following day, uh, there appeared these marks in the soil, but that's a different thing. In this case, a ring was found in the soil beneath what some said was a flying saucer. What did that turn out to be, or what was the story It, it turned out to be uh, the natural reproduction of fungus, of a certain kind of fungus. When you take samples, you take double sets of samples, and if it's possible, you give them to different uh, institutions. And the conclusion was very clear. We're fungus, no doubt about it. But that was just one case. Really How many dedicated. investigations? Probably 250 to 300 uh, UFO reports. Again, I had to ask. The first thing I want to emphasize, I'm talking about this my personal experience. What I did know firsthand, working myself. What have you found? It comes after all this hard work done very consciously along these four decades and something. And what I can say from my experience is... Now remember, Milton is a radio man. If you put it in terms of communications, the ratio between noise and signal was enormous. There was a big noise and a little bit signal. It means that from a hundred UFO reports, well investigated, we come to the conclusion that 98.5 to 99 percent have very plausible explanations. Now that leaves a tiny but one to one and a half percent of unexplained phenomenon. In his third book, researched in the United States, he explains, like a Sherlock Holmes again, that one percent, one and a half percent that is left unexplained could be perfectly attributed to, first, some natural phenomena that scientifically, scientifically was not known until the end of the last decade. Second, two, top secret experiments and top secret operational missions, particularly referred to, but not exclusively to, activities of, of reconnaissance. His other argument is that these sightings are something of a Cold War phenomenon. After the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, it's a symbol of the end of the Soviet Union and then the end of the tensions of the Cold War and a new world that comes out after that. There's no more need to go on with this issue of UFOs. Was there a cover-up? Yes, there was a cover-up, but the cover-up was totally different of what is generally said. It was not a cover, an official cover-up of extraterrestrial beings doing something among us. Mm -hmm. It was a cover-up of what some human beings were doing in relation to mm -hmm. other human beings. 
So why then do these credible individuals and an estimated 50 percent of the thinking population still think that just maybe we are not alone? Something that you can pick up in hundreds of cases is what I will call the conditioning of the human mind. With all the books, TV shows, and films about extraterrestrial life. <laughs> There's no recovered spaceship. Oh, excuse me, Mr. President. That's not entirely accurate. And because we've all been fascinated by the possibility Milton explains there's a little bit of doubt and wonder in all of us. Some people get impacted by this. Really, uh, the power of suggestion in terms of the human mind is very, very powerful. That said, I had to ask, do you believe? Of course, I, I don't need to believe. They are, of course, unidentified flying objects, and that's it. not extraterrestrial, aerial, or space. Uh, aerospace vehicles, which is something totally different. And what if one lands in your backyard? Well, I'd be, I'd be more than pleased to welcome them if one day they decide to say, well, let's make a visit to these earthlings there. Who better to visit than Milton Our Cave? If, if anyone wants to get in contact with me just to request a book or to change ideas or to uh, pose some questions, I would be more than glad to receive your, your mail. And I repeat, my email address is milwash, M-I-L-W-A-S-H, at erols.com. Okay. Thanks for watching. Please let us know who's watching. We'll try and respond to all your comments and questions.